Uh, welcome to the program on the World Design Center. My name is Mike Stepner, and I'll be your moderator for the panel discussion conversation this morning. Uh, as you know, the San Diego Tijuana region was selected as the world design capital for 2024. We're the first American city to be selected, the first binational region to be selected. So it is indeed an honor that we are very unique in, in what we're going to be doing. Uh, this is, um, and recognize all our accomplishments. And you'll see in, in a few moments, the, uh, the program that the uh, sponsors put on, but uh, it's something that's more, it's a recognition of what we have done, but it's more than that. This is something that we will not celebrate on one January 24 with a sheet cake and a little party. It's something that we're building up to. It's an obligation. It's an opportunity. It's a framework for really looking at the issues that are facing our community, how we can raise the design consciousness of the San Diego Tijuana region, and build on, on those assets that we already have and continue to expand. Uh, it is a framework that we really need to build on. This is the, the uh, thing we're going to talk about today and the start of the conversation. In a recent op-ed in the San Diego UT, No Time to Rest on Our Laurels, Roger Sholey and Mary Walshock of UCSD <clears throat> wrote an, an op-ed, and they said that we need to reimagine, we need to, I'm sorry, we need to Imagine, imagine that Lively, I can't even pronounce it this morning, and collaboratively work together to realize the opportunity this win represents for our entire binational region, but not rest in our laurels. We need to up our game in architecture, urban design, unclog our transportation networks, and conserve our natural resources. We need to design our social and economic future on both sides of the border. This is the charge that the WDC designation really has for us. We have a distinguished panel uh, to discuss this this morning, and I will introduce them shortly. But it is especially timely that we start doing this. The pandemic, we're in our second year. And while the pandemic really has, has not uncovered any new problems, it has uncovered a lot of old problems that we have not dealt with. It has uh, urban... Uh, I keep getting a phone call here, but that's... Uh, It has uncovered uh, social justice, economic disparity, climate change, healthy urbanism, all these things that we have known are problems that we have not fully addressed, but the pandemic has created a new sense of urgency for really looking at all these things. And I believe the WTDC designation really gives us an opportunity to frame all these things and to work on them. Uh, let me introduce our panel. We have Michelle Morris, the Associate Director of the UC Design, San Diego Design Lab, uh, President and Co-Founder of the Design Forward Alliance, Principal at Hardport Solutions Consulting Firm, and Instructor at Stanford's Design School, uh, D School, the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies at the University of San Diego, and the Design Academy and Somersault Innovation. <clears throat> David McCullough is a Principal Landscape Architect with McCullough Landscape Architecture. He is a 2023 20, 20, president of the San Diego Architectural Foundation and a member of the AIA San Diego Urban Design Committee. He also chairs the city's historical resources board and a member <coughs> of the city's code uh, monitoring team. Marjorie Whitlock is the principal of architectural, con principal architectural concepts San Diego and focuses on uh, on hospitality and commercial design with projects nationally and internationally. Marge is a director and past president of the San Diego Architectural Foundation. Maylin Levine is a partner and designer in Visual Asylum. She is president of AIG San Diego and is a founder and president of the Urban Discovery Charter School. Levine is also a design instructor at UCSD Extension where she developed the new certificate program in communications design. And lastly, Carlos Cristiani, Born and raised in Mexico City, enrolled at UC San Diego in 2002, and established Provincial Business Consultants, and built a, a couple of businesses, including Cigarro Brewing in Baja, California. More, most recently, he was executive director of the San Diego Tijuana World Design Capital bid effort. 
And so we hope to have a very stimulating conversation with the panelists and with all of you who are in the audience this morning. So with that, I'll turn it over to Michelle. Great, hello everyone. My name is Michelle. It's wonderful to be spending Saturday morning with you here, even if it's on Zoom. Happy New Year to, uh, to you. I'm just gonna share my screen. Our thought today was we would just do a little level setting on um, you know, what this thing is in case people are uh, unsure and then, uh, and then jump into sort of where we've been briefly and then where we are now so we can have this amazing conversation with our panelists and with you. So what is the World Design Capital? In case you're unaware, um, it is a designation that's given every two years by the World Design Organization. And as you can see uh, on this slide here, it's, it's really meant for emerging global cities that are you know, uniquely positioned for strategic growth. Uh, it definitely wants to recognize cities for the use of design across sectors and for growth and development. And then also really showcasing some of the best practices as we join this global cohort of world design cities. Uh, Carlos can put in the chat the World Design Organization uh, link as well as the World Design Capital Pass Cities in case you're interested offline. So as you can see here, everything from, you know, Turin, Seoul, Helsinki, Keg Town, Taipei, Mexico City, Leo Metropolis, and now Valencia, we're joining this amazing group of cities um, to be the World Design Capital 2024, as was mentioned earlier, first binational dual host, uh, dual city, you know, regional uh, host, and then the first U.S. city designation as well. So it's pretty exciting. Um, we thought you might be interested in hearing what, what, what did the world design capital say? You know, how, why did we win? We were up against Moscow and as a finalist, and then they won't disclose the other uh, applicants. Um, but we know in the past they've ranged not only from those that have won, but, you know, e even here in Chicago at one point uh, in the U.S. has applied. So we, we know there were other applicants and we were told that these are the four big reasons. They're very interested in the community driven uh, DNA that we have in the design that we do and what that means. Um, they're very interested in our, our binational DNA. Um, they love this expanded definition of design um, from the, the practitioners and the expertise that is really rich in our binational region, all the way through to uh, sort of what's happened in, in the mainstream, you know, business and civic sectors around how do we apply some of that design, um, you know, power into strategy and policy and, and other realms. And then they really love that throughout our, uh, our bid and what we showcase during uh, the shortlist uh, site visit, uh, that you know, we're really dedicated to, to social justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, uh, both collectively and individually, since those are not synonymous. Um, sustainability and education, in addition to obviously uh, the broad spectrum of design that we have and, and, and the value of design as we see it here in our region. So where did this all come from? Uh, so, you know, I joined the design lab back in 2014. And um, out of that, uh, I won't bore you with all the details, happy to, to share them at a later time. Um, but out of that, uh, the Design Forward Alliance formed along with um, some amazing uh, design practitioners in the community. And the very first time we publicly stated that we were one day going to be the world design capital was at the world at the Design Forward Summit in 2016. Again, we'll put, uh, we'll put a link to, to the little 90 second video if you haven't seen that yet. Um, and then, and then it was just a lot of discussions about how we would go about this meeting with the World Design Organization, meeting with past designees, understanding if this was the right move even for our region or if there was a better platform. And then over time, you know, alongside, I mean, as you can see, hundreds of binational designers and partners, uh, it started to really started to gel. And then uh, when the pandemic hit, uh, we said, as the Design Forward Alliance, we said, you know what, we need to move this forward. We then uh, partnered with Amelia Levine, who uh, helped us lead us through the bid phase, uh, and then Carlos Cristiani and Sofia Eichner helping us get through the shortlist phase, et cetera. We'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. But the bottom line is, this is really deeply seated, and it goes well beyond the, you know, the World Design Capital, Design Forward Alliance, UCSD. Uh, many of you here on the call have been doing projects and collaborations and, and, and you know, various activities that have really uh, laid the groundwork and such to help pave the path for where we are today. So uh, we just we get to now really celebrate and, and um, uh, augment what we've been doing. Carlos, do you want to take it uh, from here? 
Yes, of course. Um, hi, everyone. And uh, of course, our theme is uh, the concept of home. Uh, it is a concept that we can all relate to at a very, uh, at the level of a very, you know, the core of uh, the human experience in, you know, uh, related to design that we can all, again, it sounds repetitive, but we can all relate to. Um, and next slide. If it, it is, you know, home means a lot of things, especially in our binational region. It is a home to a robust, a fantastic uh, community of uh, design professionals. Um, it is also, um, you know, the definition of home as a place for refuge, a place for inspiration, a place that gets built with micro uh, actions that we, that we do every single day. Um, it means uh, for, for those that have to translate the border into their daily lives. It means consistently having to design that experience with the changes uh, you know, of that political boundary and, and how they do that effectively to an extent that it basically disappears uh, in the world of 3 million people that cross the border um, you know, very, very, very often. And it is also an acronym. It's also an acronym for human-centered, uh, the age, O for open. Um, I speak always of the open part of the, uh, of, of the concept because uh, in my own experience, I am a transplant from Mexico City. I came here in 2002. San Diego um, very graciously adopted me very quickly. I was, I was impressed by how quickly I was introduced to um, a lot of uh, stakeholders and I became a San Diegan very quickly. Some years later, I lived in Tijuana and I experienced exactly the same thing. Um, and um, having lived in other, in other places in Mexico, in Europe before, um, this was transformational. I say that I used to be from Mexico City and I am now uh, binational, equipped with this set of two uh, identities that are not exclusive one of each other. Uh, we're also multidisciplinary and multicultural. And uh, my favorite one, of course, uh, we are experimental. We're not afraid of taking risks. Uh, we go for it. If we fail, we keep doing it and we keep doing it until we get it right. And, uh, and that is just very exciting. Um, so what does this you know, mean for the region in, in economic terms, in, in you know, return on investment? We are looking at 1.5 billion together there's, uh, you know, an economic impact study for San Diego. There is a mirroring study for Tijuana, and um, and just with the numbers that we have locally, uh, we can probably um, arrive to a 1.5 billion dollar in economic impact in the region, uh, with of course a huge boost in uh, direct and indirect jobs, and uh, and of course, you know, our uh, booming uh, tourism industry on both sides of the border. That, uh, that needs to be reactivated. So this is a story of also reactivation beyond, uh, beyond of course, the fantastic stories of design that we carry through the, um, through the initiative, but also you know, human development and economic development. And the timeline that, you know, that, that started back in March, you know, and Michelle talked about this six years of history in the making um, and that, you know, uh, in a way culminated but started again uh, in March with, uh, with submitting the, the, um, the proposal to, uh, to the World Design Organization and, uh, and the great work that Michelle, Maylin and the, you know, the uh, partner organizations did. Um, the bid was accepted in May by the World Design Organization and uh, the city was shortlisted alongside with the city of Moscow uh, in July, well, the, to the region, um, San Diego, Tijuana. Uh, in October, we produced a fantastic uh, site visit experience. Uh, we gave a voice to the community and we produced about 16 mini events. Well, some of them not that many, There's some of them were pretty large, uh, but, but we allowed the community to speak for itself and present you know, uh, the pretty and the gritty. Uh, we, we talked about the great uh, success stories that we have binationally, but we also talked very candidly about our, our challenges and our problems and what things we want to tackle uh, through the lens of design. Uh, in November, uh, San Diego Tijuana region was announced as the World Design Capital 2024, uh, the first US city, the first uh, region of two cities in two different countries uh, to be announced. So we, we broke the mold of 
the World Organization uh, way of um, uh, giving out this designation. And it also becomes the second city for Mexico. Um, then what do we have into the future? This is where we go into the implementation phase. We, um, uh, we're in the heels of completing the, uh, the final details of the uh, negotiations for the host regional agreement. Uh, that has been, you know, an incredibly uh, a large project in itself. Uh, and we go into the administration phase with the World Design Organization. This is where we build out the organization. We are going to be holding a lot of community sessions. We uh, go, you know, by the, the you know, the ethos of uh, being community driven. And uh, we're very proud of, uh, you know, carrying out that uh, in every single thing that we do. Uh, this is exactly where we are right now. Uh, in Q2 of 2022, April, June, uh, we have some orientation sessions with the, w, uh, with the WDO and uh, the official signing uh, ceremony uh, for WDC 2024. And then uh, as we go into Q3 and the rest of the year, uh, it's you know the uh, build out from uh, what we're going to do in the first half of the year and then uh, jumping right into planning uh, the program. And Michelle, go ahead. Go ahead, Michelle. And so, um, so you know, just it, it's worth pointing out that you know, rather than it being one organization, uh, it, we were we really needed in order to make this happen. Because I didn't mention this on an earlier slide, but you might have seen at the bottom of why we won a little asterisk with uh, too audacious. The the, the biggest uh, point of trepidation for the WDO in granting us this designation uh, was they thought we might be being too audacious. They were concerned about that. <laughs> And so we're, we're not concerned about that because we're very experimental and that's kind of what we do. Um, however, uh, it was very important. Uh, usually the, the WDO makes an agreement with us with a city with one city and with the city government. Uh, like pretty much every stage of this process with the WDO, we're kind of redefining what that model is, not just for our region, but for the world. Uh, and so there's this partnership here uh, that it has, has come together for the fiscal and operational um, responsibilities. And then uh, from there, obviously, that, that's that's there's thousands of, of people that will be contributing to this. But I will say, uh, it's it's harder to do community driven design, it's harder to do multi partner uh, uh, initiatives, as I know many of you know, and I think that you know that's one of the things we can be proud of. We're, we're not afraid to lean into that because quite frankly, that's what the world needs right now. Um, and and has, has probably always needed. Um, Moving forward into uh, into sort of where we are now, so it's a little bit of the backdrop. Um, you know, as Carlos mentioned, sort of the, the tag phrase, uh, uh, you know, for uh, for several of the cities in the cohort that stemmed from South Africa was, you know, the pretty and the gritty, and that's not to dilute. Uh, uh, design in any way, but to say, hey, look, let's be authentic. We can't just showcase what we do really well. We also have to really talk about the constraints, right, as well as the opportunities. And so that's how we see this, This, uh, as uh, some of the introductory comments uh, alluded to, that's really how we see this initiative. Um, our overall vision is we're, we're designing the future, right? Uh, we want this to be uh, the, the, the challenge for transporter collaboration like we haven't seen it before or how maybe only appears in pockets um, so that we can really design for a more equitable and more inspiring future. The way that we're going to do that, sort of the three buckets are we do want to celebrate the design community across that spectrum of design um, in a very real way. We want to showcase what, you know, some of the amazing achievements and things that we have, we, we do here in San Diego, Tijuana, in a way that it has not been celebrated before, so that we can uh, start to maybe elevate this, the, the conversation around design and what it means for, for <laughs> the, the heart and soul of our community. Uh, we also want to catalyze existing efforts. So partnering with elected officials to find out what the priorities are in their districts or in their areas, right? Partnering with organizations, uh, you know, Howard, you put something in the chat earlier, seeing what's already out there rather than saying, hey, we're bringing a bunch of stuff in, let's do it. Um, because there is a little bit of that with the World Design Organization, but this is about us. This is, a, this is about us having collective ownership and augmenting, supporting, being inspired by, and then the third one, co-creating uh, things that maybe we weren't wouldn't be able to do uh, otherwise. The framework that we're using and that you can find on the website home2024.org alongside some examples of what these look like, we're calling them the six design stories because that spectrum of design is pretty big. And so um, without going into too, too much detail, um, you know, 
the, the, these are the stories that we shared with the WDO to say, here's how we're thinking about design and how some of the projects are going to appear. You know, our approach to design first and foremost is driven by our values. It is about people. It is about what we believe in um, collectively, you know, and there's two cities that we have some, we have, we have different backgrounds. And so how does that come together um, as a mode of learning? You know, design as a champion, uh, you know, we, we champion design as a mode of learning. As you can see here, we want this to be authentic, emerging from community and culture. Um, we want this to be a catalyst for intelligent systems. There's a lot of talk about smart cities, but also really empathic social systems, getting back to that human, the humanity that we so desperately uh, need, particularly in today's times. Uh, certainly advancing climate action uh, design and then incubating what we're calling design driven innovation, which keeps design as an undercurrent, like the intent or the purpose behind some of the innovations coming out there. Uh, Carlos, do you want to say just briefly, um, uh, and the presentation is almost finished, just so you know, but just a little bit about how this might manifest in uh, between now and then 2024. Yeah, so we're going to have uh, several ways uh, for engagement, especially for community and as we go into into content. But this is this is basically the framework we have, uh, you know, uh, an overarching ring of world design events that um, we will list in just a second. Uh, then we have some regional challenges. Uh, there's, of course, legacy project areas. If you uh, look into what other cities have done in the past, uh, particularly um, in the case of South Africa, I think they are. Um, um, you know, Cape Town is a great success story on those legacy project areas and community highlights. So we're going to have, you know, there's the boat is large enough to accommodate a, a lot of projects. Uh, just as an example, uh, using again Cape Town, they were able to produce about almost 500 uh, projects, independent projects, not all of them infrastructure, but 500 projects that were, you know, planned, executed and completed and, and documented. Um, and an example of one of those regional challenge challenges and probably uh, also a, a legacy project is Friendship Park. Um, we have, you know, right now as the project stands, you know, it, 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 is, uh, it is riddled with a lot of challenges that I think collectively through the lens of design and, you know, lobbying elected officials and governments, uh, we can push forward. And we, all, we also have the receipts for that, um, the cross-border, Express CBX, um, which is you know the only private port of entry, uh, is already uh, you know uh, in operation. Um, that was an impossible project ten years ago, and uh, and it is possible. There is a way through design and through talking with um, with partnering with government to make things happen. Um, and another um, another example of this is, and you know it's a great example. I always uh, speak about Balboa Park um, because. The genesis of Balboa Park comes from a failed bid to become the World Expo back in 1915, and uh, we lost, of course, to uh, to the Bay Area. And uh, and as a result, civic leaders and city officials at the time they partnered together and they decided, well, we're going to do our own fair and we're going to do the Panama California exhibition, and that's how we ended up with Balboa Park. So the transformational you know, power of this initiative uh, is going to propel us into the future. Yes, to celebrate what we have as we exist right now, but how do we imagine a better future for us all in the region? And the WDC signature events, this is an example. We, seven events have to be produced uh, per our contract. Um, I will talk just a, about a couple of them um, as a sample. Um, we have, for example, the, the World Policy Conference in uh, which is, you know, uh, a panel to have, uh, you know, people from around the world that work in policy making, policy makers, uh, and, and have them share their success stories and their challenges with us, and of course, us with them, so that we can all be inspired. We have the WDC Spotlight, which is a celebration of the binational region in itself and, um, and, and, and our, our design community. And around, you know, on top of this, this is kind of a visual representation of what the year of the celebration could look like. Um, in, in orange, you have, you know, the signature events, but then you have other events that are also um, can be, you know, housed under the umbrella of, of the initiative. And, uh, and an entire year 
of uh, of programming is is uh, can feel daunting. We have a year, almost two years to plan that, um, and I think you know with with the help of the community, we can put together a fantastic fantastic program. Um, and then uh, Michelle, I go back to you for next steps. Yeah, so in wrap up, so here's what we know right now. We know that the World Design Organization uh, has a slew of administrative things that we are taking care of right now behind the scene. And that, um, as mentioned in the earlier timeline, uh, at the end of Q1, they are going to, you know, they're really focused on Valencia right now, um, as they will be for us, you know, when, when it's 2024. And then as we move into, into Q2, uh, they will be really kicking off uh, what we've been told is quite a robust orientation. Um, we have our frameworks. We have lots of feedback. Uh, from you know before we even submitted the bid um, from organizations uh, such as this that have said hey you know this, these are lessons we've learned over the years um, and then specifically around the bid and the site list at uh, the site visit um, and we're always getting feedback in so these are this is the information that we know and then we want to use moving forward what's still under construction is that organizational architecture and some of the processes which are integrated with the WDO. So we're getting as much information as we can so that we're not wasting time. Um, however, it's uh, it's not something that we can do standalone. Um, so we have this unique opportunity in Q1 to be thinking about, okay, before the WDO superimposes all the things that we have to do for 2024, um, go, going back to, I think what Roger uh, and or Mike said, you know. We're interested in 2024. We want to have a year-long celebration, but we're really interested in the other stuff too, um, if not more so. So go to home 2024, see what's happened, uh, uh, see what you know, see what's uh, you know what's out there and what we can do um, in terms of the, you know what what inspires you for the the six stories and um, what happened during the site visit. Um, check out what's happening in Valencia. Check out what's happened in past cities. We will put those uh, links in the chat uh, to make it a little easier for you, but get some inspiration. Um, and because it's not for us, we also want to see what we can do with the cohort in the longer term. Um, there's an involvement survey that we've been taking that asks, like, what are your superpowers? What are events that you know about that need to go on the calendar? Uh, what are things that you just want to talk about? that you maybe haven't been able to do or that you want to take to the next level. Let's let's chat um, or how you can get involved. How do you want to be involved in the organization that's going to be built out? And then, you know, join our distribution list on the home 2024 website. You can add your information and then you'll get all the uh, the newsletters, emails and stuff that goes out. Um, and then I would just say as we move into the panel, um, these are some three things I think that, that we can really that think about right now as citizens of this binational region and what excites us. Like we want this to be fun. We want this to really be invigorating uh, in addition to the, the, the hard work that's gonna go along with it. How do we leverage this global platform as I mentioned? And then, you know, how does my work or our work depending on your perspective um, or your you know, organization, how does it map to uh, what you've seen here today um, or go beyond? So I will pause there. Uh, lots of all this is done on Zoom, which I know, know is not new to you all. <laughs> so this is just one of thousands of, of screenshots uh, of people involved. And um, you know, it's great to know that we have such important leadership uh, 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 support from uh, our mayor's office as well as that of Tijuana. Okay, thank you. Gracias. I'll stop thank sharing you. my screen. Thank you, Carlos and, and Michelle. Maylin, did you want to add some things to this discussion and then we'll open it up? Sure. Thank you so much um, for including me in the panel. Um, I'll just say that I chaired um, the bid uh, committee, which was an amazing effort. I'm so thankful for the opportunity to have done that um, and to have done that during a worldwide pandemic uh, quarantine period, which made it even more challenging and interesting um, and rewarding to really have the conversations that we got to have from March of 2020 through to our bid submission. I was also involved in the design of the bid document itself. So I got to know all of the stories that everyone um, worked together to collaborate um, to make up our bid. And so I'm just very proud to have been uh, a part of that winning bid. Now we can say that we had the winning bid um, for 2024. Um, I'm here today really representing AIGA now. I'm the president of the organization. And I will just say that 
to share a few things that we are thinking about um, and have already started uh, work towards for 2024, leading up to 2024. So some things that um, AIGA has been doing for 25 years is putting on a design conference. And so we will finally be putting on the Y25, 25th anniversary conference that should have happened in 2020. Uh, will happen in the fall in September this year. So be glad to share the information about that. But the hope is that we grow the conference um, this year and next year to ultimately be a much larger international design conference. Um, similar in, in thinking to what used to be the Aspen International Design Conference. So we've really taken on the challenge of okay, we're gonna be on the world stage in 2024, AIGA San Diego, what are you gonna do? And so this is our big audacious idea is to grow our, our conference that's been so successful over the years. And then we're also uh, have been doing a couple of other things over the years that this initiative really gives us opportunity to also take to, a, to a, the next level and that is education. And so we've been doing a program called LINK, which has been funded by a grant um, from the Coyne Family Foundation for the last 20 years. We're doing that as well. And that brings design education to at-risk high school youth. And so our plan is to also grow that program. And to ultimately, the goal is to partner with um, and bring design education into San Diego Unified School District. Um, and then we're also expanding link to K-8, knowing that kids being you know, exposed to the arts and design earlier um, and families uh, would make a difference in answering the age old question, where are all the black designers? We spent the last two years in conversations um, and we've said it you know, over and over and over again. They're not, they don't exist yet because they don't know about design and families don't know this is an opportunity um, for a great career choice. So anyway, that's one thing also that we're, um, that we're looking to expand. And then 25 years ago in 2022, this will be our 25th anniversary of Contacto, which was a bi-national initiative that the design community started, um, just having conversations with our cohorts in, in Baja. And it culminated in a conference. And so we'll be celebrating the 25th and launching the next generation of contacto or contact with um, our cohorts in Baja. Um, so yeah, I mean, we're, we're already started on all of these things, not waiting for the WDO to <laughs> give us San Diego the blessing to go forward. We, I, I just would share that I think that it belongs to all of us, this, this designation and that I think that it's an opportunity to just think big, right? And, and not be, um, I think San Diego, you know, the, the whole goal with the bid was to not be so timid. San Diego has been really good about keeping this best kept secret, right? About who we are and what we do and all of the great uh, design and design work that's happening and designers. And that bid was our way of saying, here we are loud and proud. So anyway. That's all I have to say right now. Thanks, May Lynn. I'm going to call on Margaret and then David. We, uh, as you said, as Carlos said, that we're looking at challenges and problems that we can start to address as part of this designation as the rural design capital. And I think it, it really starts today. We have a lot of issues out there. I mentioned, you know, the things that are caused by are the discovery of problems by, that we haven't addressed due to the pandemic, like social justice, like uh, economic disparity, like healthy urbanism, like climate change. They're all tied together, they're all connected and they all relate to design in the both the narrowest sense and the broadest sense in the social and physical. How uh, the two of you are representing the design professions who are part of this whole program, uh, the built environment design professions, any thoughts on how you see this really fitting into what we as design professionals in the built environment have been doing or should be doing, maybe doing, to tie all this together and become part of the program? 
I think um, our mission at the San Diego Architectural Foundation is to engage the general public in the value of the built environment. And through that, we, we do that through education and shenanigans. So we have, you know, many programs that have um, a lot of different voices that come together from different cultures and different backgrounds and different demographics. And we, we embrace that because it's really, um, it's important to have a platform. And so I, I feel like the San Diego Architectural Foundation is that kind of platform for diversity and social awareness, as well as an environmental and the built environment. So our, our agenda probably for 2024 is to really up the game on education and conversation and um, you know, cross-border events together. We have to do it together. This, obviously, we don't have a lot of support from government or um, you know, the infrastructure. So we must, we, we've been doing it together. We're going to continue to do it together. But we, we need to be louder and get more engagement and somehow uh, really make it known throughout the whole region that this is not just about architects and landscape architects and designers getting together. It's all of us. It's about your moms, your dads, your sisters, your kids, you know, every, everybody who may or may not have access to architecture and design, it's time for them to understand that there's, there's a whole world there for us to engage in and make it part of our daily lives. Yeah, Mike, I, you know, personally, I, th I think it's really exciting what's, what's happening here with this, uh, you know, San Diego, for the rest of the world, is uh, beautiful beaches and a great climate, right? And it always has been. But there really is some great things happening here, especially from a built environment standpoint. Um, I, I just want to say that I was asked uh, as part of or to represent the San Diego Architectural Foundation and, and you know, the built environment here in San Diego to be a part of uh, one of the events where they welcomed the gentleman that was the committee that came from Toronto uh, to visit San Diego in the bid. And uh, from what I understand, he was just coming back from Moscow. And so he had just got off the plane. And, um, you know, I've, I've been to Moscow and uh, I will say that, you know, my experience there was, and, and I, I would say that, you know, Moscow is arguable, arguably one of the most ostentatious, um, you know, architectural built environment uh, environments in the world, right? It's incredible. So like I had this vision in my mind of this, this guy, you know, getting off the airplane and be, being met at the airport with a limousine, uh, with a delegate, uh, you know, uh, like a group of delegates and probably tuxedos and nonstop free flowing vodka, right? And literally just just partying, you know, and having fun and, and like just this incredible experience in one of the most opulent cities in the world. And then coming to San Diego and, you know, uh, and, and he, the, I guess when, when I was asked to be a part of this, he had just arrived. I mean, they literally went and picked him up at the airport. I think uh, Michelle Morris picked him up at the airport and drove him to uh, La Jolla where we were having this event. And I was thinking, um, boy, you know, how, how are we gonna compete with Moscow? You know, yeah, we've got beautiful beaches and a great climate, but Moscow, I mean, that's, that's I, I just, I'll be honest with you, I didn't see it really happening. And, um, <laughs> So I, um, you know, I, I, I kind of, uh, the thing that, I, the takeaway here is that I think the world is kind of in a, a new place and, um, you know, opulence and ostentatiousness is um, maybe not what the rest of the world is looking for. They're looking for, um, they're looking for sort of the, the human spirit and, and the craft and what we do and, um, and I think that's what, what San Diego and Tijuana, specifically the region, really embody at a, just an amazing level. Because like, let me give you an example. Um, you know, other cities, let's say, you know, um, Bill Bao has Frank Gehry building, you know, these incredible structures. And I mean, these things are happening all over the world by Starkitects. And, and, um, and what does San Diego have? It's a question. What do we have? We have the Salk Institute and it's, it's an incredible thing, but it's, um, it's, it's very sort of sublime and, uh, you know, sort of, it's not, it's not the least bit opulent, right? Um, and so 
you know, I think that what's happened here is, you know, Tijuana with Mexico City, and Carlos said this earlier on a discussion that we had, Washington, our federal governments are just, there's never been any love there. It's just been, it's, it's been a, just a terrible situation for years and years. Um, however, these two cities, San Diego and, and Tijuana, I mean, you know, if, if you get down to Tijuana, uh, most people in Tijuana don't see it as two cities. They see Tijuana and San Diego as, as being uh, one united city. And, um, and, and I think that, you know, we're two cities that despite the, the arrogance and the, um, just the ridiculous nature of what the, the place our federal governments have put us, we're just making stuff happen. Like there's some incredible things happening. You go down to Valle de Guadalupe and, and Tijuana, the federal government's not helping out. They're not doing anything. The infrastructure there is terrible. But the, the community is, is doing amazing things. And I'll say San Diego is the same thing. I mean, our, our, uh, you know, our, our political environment is a little bit sour, but, um, but the people in San Diego and this, this clash of cultures that's coming together has, has created so many little things that uh, just people that are, are passionate and um, have this inspiration for greater things are doing. And so I would say that what makes San Diego and Tijuana great is not the one big, you know, Bill Bow. It's not, it's not this, the star architecture. It's all the little incredible things that people have done despite the lack of um, support by, you know, the, the political environment that we were in. So I think that's a great thing. And I think that's what the role design capital uh, bid sort of put it out there, Carlos, Maylin, Michelle, and everybody involved, they, they really, I, th I think they saw that and they put that out there. And with that said, my, you know, like I said, I was, I was skeptical when, when this guy came from Moscow, but now looking back and in, in retrospect, we, you know, we won this bid. And I, I think, yeah, of course, of course we did. And so the things that I think, you know, other cities have sort of looked at and, and you know, I had a discussion with Roger Scholler er, earlier and he totally disagrees. He, he was saying, we need that. We need that big, you know, Stark Attack thing to happen here because that's what's going to draw attention. And he might be right about that. But I will say that um, I think we need to point out what's great here. And that's that's all these little interventions in, in the built environment that uh, that is unparalleled in the world as far as I know. So anyways, I'm excited. And I think that's where we need to go with this. Let me add to that. I, I think that Michelle just wrote in the chat, the thousand experiments. Uh, and we talked a little bit about design and the big, the big important project, but also design with a little D, all those little things that add up to something really big. I want to ask particularly Marcia and David, but also the rest of the panel and the rest of the audience, if anybody wants to weigh in, how do we begin to apply this opportunity that the WDC has given us to really address the issues, the challenges and problems that, that uh, Carlos mentioned a few minutes ago? How do we begin to apply those to, to deal with things like climate equity, with inf the, you know, we, the lack of infrastructure, the, um, the really relationships across the border that, that we know it's there intellectually, but emotionally, we don't always buy into that. But how do we uh, deal with communities of concern? And I, and I just would be interested in, in how, from design professionals in the built environment, how you would see using this opportunity to address some of those. And again, from <clears throat> Michelle and Carlos and, and May Lynn, but also from anybody else who wants to <coughs> me raise their hand that's in the audience th this morning. So speak. OK, so. Um... It's going to take public-private um, partnership. We need to have um, individuals, uh, organizations, and governments come together and understand um, the many threads it takes to make a fabric. And that's what we need. We need a fabric of ideas and policies, initiatives, small and large to come together to create almost like a little blanket between San Diego and Tijuana. So, you know, let's cover ourselves in a big, beautiful blanket that we weave together. And, um, we, but it's gonna take a lot of effort and a, not, a lot of 
compromise and discussion. And so I'd like to hear other people's you know, thoughts on that as well. Yeah, you know, I, I think that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's, there's sort of a general feeling. Marjit and I hosted a, an event in Tijuana called Context under the banner of the San Diego Architectural Foundation. Uh, what was that, Marjit, two or three years ago now? That would be, I think, 2018. Yeah. Pre-pandemic. In 2019, because well, yeah. we had so much yeah. fun. <laughs> and and I, like I, I mentioned, we kept on hearing over and over again from, I mean, arguably some of the greatest um, modern architects that joined us at this this event. Um, they're you know down there in Tijuana or Mexico, uh, Mexico City, or just like uh, the thing that we kept on hearing was that again they, they don't see it as two different cities they see it as one region and you know i think that um there there maybe isn't the same feeling or perception by uh by some people here in san diego and um and and that's that's a little unfortunate i think that um you know the the, the key thing here is and i mean i i just hope that it it spurs um, closer, tighter connections and better understanding of, of the power of us together as, you know, a, a larger body rather than, you know, uh, two cities separated by this giant fence. You know, I think that, that you raise a good point. I, I participated in the, in the one in 2018, and I reminded people that I participated in a similar conference 15 years earlier, standing on the same stage, giving the same kind of talk. And we all went home. You know, we had a nice meal, we had a nice time, we all went home and promptly forgot everything in the earlier one. I think the, the fact that this is a joint binational effort really is a way of, of making this thing last and not uh, being a one-off that we go down there and have a good time and talk to each other and go home. So I think that's an important part of what the WDC designation can do for our region. Is there anybody else out there who wants to comment on, on what they think about how we might address some of these issues? I, just... I do see that like Diane that. has a question. So I'm going to ask Diane okay. to unmute quick and then ask your question. Hi. Let's see. Let me... Hi, everybody. Um, you may know me. My video was, there we go. Uh, you may know me as an architectural historian. I've taught at New School for about 10 years, and I'm currently teaching a class on San Diego's architectural history at UCSD. And as I get to the modern period, I, some of the themes that I pull through my class is uh, the fact that San Diego's really real estate, not architecture. Uh, the best projects are being done, uh, historically would be done by architects from out of town. And most recently, the best projects are small lot urban infill projects that are being done by local architects. I think a lot of them inspired by Ted Smith and, and by, um, oh, my brain just threw a fuse. But anyway, it's, it's this work that's coming out of Woodbury where the younger architects are learning how to be their own developers and are working on very small projects as urban infill. And these are fabulous projects. They are so inventive. And, and are using material, they're, they're getting into the context of the various neighborhoods. So one of the ideas I'd like to throw out is in this current uh, housing affordability crisis, what we really have not looked at is adaptive reuse of existing buildings and not necessarily existing housing or existing hotels or motels. I'm talking about offices that are gonna be underused retail that's going to be underused, uh, huge shopping plazas. We tend to scrape everything down to the ground and start over again with the big visions. I think we need to be thinking smaller into how do we do sensitive and thoughtful interventions into the built environment we already have to retool it for sustainability and for inclusion. So that would be one of the thoughts I would throw out there. And in order to carry this forward for some, some big initiatives, one of the things I've started is a small conversation with folks in historic preservation on how we take the state historic building code and take that concept to apply to a new ordinance 
that provides some regulatory relief for adaptive reuse of older building stock, not necessarily historic, but for affordable housing. So we're, we're looking into, there, there are actually a number of these ordinances around the country. We're doing some research on them. We really desperately need people in building and construction to help us test these things. And we would like to bring them forward uh, through the code update process. So we have our own local code to allow us to do this. So that's, that's one thought. The other is getting into the architecture schools, uh, working on some small infill projects, you know, maybe a student design projects that eventually come to, to fruition. The third thing is historic districts. We have a number of districts that have been identified, several that have been designated, many more that are in the queue. And there are, there are very um, specific design requirements that are used in historic districts that terrify a lot of homeowners and mystify and perplex designers. So I think, again, they deal with context with existing material and how to update it to keep it viable, but uh, still moving into the future. So that, those are some ideas on how to use historic preservation. Uh, that is the small scale stuff, adaptive reuse and recycling. And what I'm thinking of is a project that Teddy Cruz did for the Venice Biennale maybe 20 years ago at this point. Uh, and his insight was that a lot of the construction material in San Diego or San Diego County, and I think he started doing cross section up in Rancho Santa Fe. And he noticed that not only people were moving back and forth across the border, but so was building material. And there was a lot of stuff being carted off construction sites in the San Diego area and making its way across the border where it was being recycled and adaptively reused. So I think that is something that, that could be a theme here. Uh, people are already doing it down in Tijuana and a lot of those people are our builders, our craftsmen. Uh, they have the knowledge and they're, and they're living the life. So instead of, you know, instead of putting up palaces, luxury palaces to the uber wealthy, which, is, which are pro proliferating in disgusting regularity in La Jolla, uh, I would love to get rid of all of this overscaled ostentatious stuff and have more of the humbler designs that are what people need to be, live comfortably in our region. So with that, I'll shut up. But, um, oh, the other thing I was, was gonna say is we could put in a bid for the California Preservation Foundation annual conference in 2024. I don't think the conference has been down here for about 10 years and it might be a good event to add to the overall calendar. Thanks very much for your patience. If anybody wants to contact me, oh, the third thing I was gonna tell you is uh, La Jolla, I am president of the La Jolla Community Planning Foundation uh, Association. And I've set up a visioning committee to look at the streetscape uh, enhancement in the entire town. And we are working with Enhance La Jolla, which is a private nonprofit, to figure out how to realize some of these projects. And Enhance La Jolla has some stuff that's in the works right now. So we kind of have a two-pronged citizen-driven approach in La Jolla to upgrade our infrastructure, which is in terrible shape. We do not look at all like the Tony vision a lot of people may have of us. Everything is crumbling, people are thoroughly disgusted, and we've decided nobody's coming to save us, we have to do it ourselves. So talk about a citizen's initiative, we've got one going in La Jolla. Okay, thanks, thanks for your attention. Larry Herzog. Yeah, <clears throat> sorry for my attire, I've just been on the stationary bike here. Uh, so um, as someone who studied the border for, for many years, I think an obvious issue for me is how do you physically find a way to connect the, the two cities across the border? Uh, what is the built environment solution to building a truly world-class twin metropolis or what, what, whatever you'd like to call it? Um, and there are a lot of challenges because if you look at the physical boundary between the two cities, it's quite diverse. Uh, uh, Michelle mentioned International Friendship Park on one end, you've got an airport, uh, you have the cross-border express, you have a lot of different, th and then San Isidro, the San Isidro-Tijuana crossing, which is the most 
challenging place of all. I've talked to Mike Stepner over the years. The city of San Diego had different ideas about what to do there. Then you also have the Otay Mesa, which is a physical plateau that has its own challenges. So I think we it would be interesting to have a kind of San Diego Tijuana uh, border master plan. Uh, I think the last one was in 1966, if I'm not remember, they did something, they tried to do something like that. And there's been some other attempts. There's an Otay Mesa, Mesa de Otay master plan that I think Sandag put together. Um, there's some other things going on, but what about a, uh, a sort of broader San Diego Tijuana master plan for the future and looking specifically at the boundary zone itself? Uh, maybe that would have its own separate name and, and, and uh, the idea of doing that, I think, could be a community project that could bring in different constituents from both sides of the border um, and look at sustainability. Uh, environmental design, as well as the kind of urban design questions. And of course, the border, the big problem is it's a crossing and you have the three crossings that you have to deal with as well. So there are a lot of questions there. I'm especially interested in San Isidro. I think San Isidro has so much potential, but it's so chaotic. There's so much going on there. It's difficult to walk on the um, U.S. side of that border. I've done it many times. I've taken my classes there and done urban design exercises on this, on this, on both sides, literally at the boundary itself. So I think we can start by looking specifically at the micro space of the the line and what goes on along that line. And we need to move away from the line as a wall, which is what happened during the last presidential administration that was obsessed with the idea of the wall. We need to stop thinking about a wall. Obviously, the world design capital is about bridging that wall. How can we as urban designers at built environment ex experts begin to think of ways, creative ways uh, to physically transform the line, the experience of crossing the line, whether in a vehicle, on foot, I think we need to think about transit at the boundary and specifically bus rapid transit, which is I think the future of transit in most cities in the world and how that could work around the line and what would be the stations and where they would be located and at least start to vision that. So I think some kind of a vision for the future of the line itself, the physical line would be a great project for uh, to think about uh, doing things that uh, might be part of the World Design uh, Capital Year 2024. So that's my, um, those are my thoughts from my uh, stationary bicycle here. Hey, Larry, I, I got a thought on that. Um, you just got me thinking about this a little bit. You know, you're right. I think, um, you know, what about, and this might be a, a question for Mike as well, who maybe knows more about these sorts of things than I do, but, you know, we have Sandag for the San Diego area uh, governments. It's incredibly powerful and uh, has the ability to get things done um, across the, the region. You know, what if there was a similar organization or what if Sandag uh, was somehow partnered with, uh, you know, Tijuana, I mean, it seems to me like there needs to be something, an organization that sort of transcends the, the you know, just the, the, um, the individual uh, government politics, right? And that's kind of what Sandag does. I don't know. Sandag, yeah, they, Sandag has a borders committee and yeah. they do very yeah. good things. And they've been, yeah, they've been involved in the Otay Mesa, Mesa de Otay plan. Uh, and they're very active. They meet regularly, um, and it has a, a long, uh, large advisory uh, group that works with it. Uh, <clears throat> but jurisdiction is a problem because, as you know, Sandeg mostly does transportation, and they don't have the authority to, to do land use planning or anything like that. And same thing on the Tijuana side. So, uh, yeah, it's a challenge. But you're right. I mean, I think uh, yeah. organizations like that could come together. And it's just, the point is the world design capital um, is an opportunity for us to start thinking about those kinds of questions. I think you're, you're absolutely right. In a, in a world design capital, it provides a framework. I, you know, whether another jurisdiction like Sandex should lead the effort or not, I don't know. We have a start. It's historic, but it's 1974 Temporary Paradise where Lynch and Appleyard looked at, at the border and did his visioning for what could be across the border. And I think it's building on something like that. It's time to take a look at some of those things that we have talked about over the years and what we can learn from them and how we can build and go forward with, with some of those ideas. And again, this is an opportunity that um, we can take advantage of. Lauren. 
Lauren? Thank you, Mike. And look at you sliding in temporary paradise. Love it. Um, always on it. So I, I love all the great ideas. Um, and I certainly love that those ideas will continue as we work through this process. Um, but for me, it's two years away. Um, <laughs> so we probably will not get through some of the red tape that we're talking about. But I do think um, San Diego is probably the largest small town I've ever been a part of. Actually, the region is that way. Um, I look around at the names on this screen and I know I've been on a committee over here doing something else with them or I know them from another venue or they were on my they were my kids soccer coach or um, that's kind of how our region has worked. And I'm looking forward to that and really leaning into our relationships, because I think, Mike, the question that you asked was, how will we get this done? What are our thoughts? And I think it's leaning into our relationships, the ones here, the ones we have next door. I'm from South Bay. Um, you know, people, it's very fluid <laughs> um, border. I, I'm excited to just leave our egos at the door um, institutionally and personally and just really collaborate effectively. And to Diane's point earlier, um, young people are, are that push. Um, they certainly want that for themselves. If that's anything we found coming out of, we're not out, I shouldn't say that, out of the last couple of years is that, hey, we're reevaluating what's important to us. Um, and I think that's going to be a really great filter as we enter into this process. I, um, I honestly, um, Michelle and Maylin, and, and I wish that you could almost present um, what was at the bid day when we were in front of that, <laughs> the delegate, um, because it was so inspiring. I think that could be repeated every other month and people would join and be inspired. So I think it's the inspirational stuff that I'm looking forward to and really just being change makers and having an open mind during the process. So that is my answer to your question, Mike Stepner. Thank you. Do we see any other hands up? I'm gonna call on some people because I know they wanna talk even if they haven't raised their hand. And so I'm gonna call on Howard, the urban visionary and commentator. Who is uh, I'm just an angry, I'm just an angry old man. Um, I'm kidding. Um, Better than that, Howard. I, I'm actually, I'll be honest with you all. I don't know what this is. I can't quite wrestle. I can't quite figure out what it means. So that makes me very excited about it. I wish that I had done more with the Design Alliance leading up to it. I was there for a, a, a little bit at the beginning with Michelle leading the group and the conversation, and I, I, I let myself lose touch. Uh, so I'm very excited about the possibilities. I don't know what it means yet, but uh, as we, we have, you know, we, we have two years to watch the, 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 I guess the schedule or the events unfold, but I'm as excited about this as I think people were about the um, Pan American uh, Expo and the 35 Expo. So, hooray. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for carrying the load. Thank you all for being a part of this. And however I can help, please ask. And yeah, I think the Congress of the New Urbanism and the APA are, would be uh, conferences is back to back or next to each other or spread out would be another good way to bring outsiders to see what San Diego is building. And I completely agree with the um, um, uh, Diane's point that the MRED um, uh, architect is developer model that San Diego has. It's a kind of an underlayer to the, you know, to the big BOSAs and Vancouver's and the international funders and the big money that's, that's building the towers downtown. There is this new vernacular that's based on, on, on a San Diego architectural model that I think is very exciting and growing and growing and growing as we need to build like, as we need to build so many more homes that's the group that'll build the bulk of the homes while the other ones build the high dollar. Homes. But you know, hey Howard, the uh, it's not just here in San Diego, it's happening down in Tijuana too. Well, that's uh, okay. So, yeah, well, his, wait, uh, so cool architecture down there, the same thing it's, is and, happening and down there, exactly. And and my point though about CNU, the Congress of New Urbanism, we're talking about hosting it in Tijuana and just touring. Uh, San Diego, because we've hosted our, our conferences in uh, Montreal uh, before as well. So we're talking about hosting it in Tijuana primarily uh, and flipping the idea. Mm. I was just, just reading the the, uh, the chat here and I noticed one, uh, let's see, Mylin 
But uh, what about a DMZ? We, I, <laughs> a demilitarization zone or something. I always thought it'd be kind of funny if we just kind of shifted the border up to uh, just north of Camp Pendleton or something, or maybe south of Camp Pendleton. And uh, <laughs> that was the original People proposal, LA. David. <laughs> the Mexicans Anyways. wanted the border up in Orange County. We wanted the border south of Ensenada. And the compromise of 1841 is where we are today. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna call on Lee from AIA. Yes. She called me on the phone and I didn't answer earlier, so I'm gonna. Thanks, Mike. Uh, well, thanks all of you. It's nice to see uh, familiar faces. Uh, so we, we've spoken a lot in the design community for the last at least decade or more, I'm sure more uh, prior preceding me, of course, um, about collaborating under a big tent um, to pr promote design with a capital D. And, and sometimes, a lot of times, with mixed su success, right? So this is the opportunity to finally bring our design community together, united under a common cause to break down the silos. And so that is one outcome that is definitely achievable and hopefully sustainable, um, an infrastructure of collaboration between and amongst the organizations, as Margaret referred to as um, the big quilt. Um, addition additionally, I think um, this international spotlight can and should empower each of us collaborating partners to continue the great work we've already been doing because um, we already have momentum in place. And so shining that spotlight on us, I think, I guess I agree with Roger Scholey in, in the desire to do it bigger and brighter and bolder. Uh, whether this designation will result in visible change to the built environment um, or improve policies and practices, I, I don't know. That's up to each of us and our networks and our work together. And I guess that's where I get a little bit more skeptical. Um, however, I think the conversations and collaborations that have already started between and, am and amongst us can result in um, meaningful outcomes, whether we know what those are yet or not. Um, and it's absolutely critical that these conversations continue and don't cease after 2024. I think that's really important, too. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. You know, again, it's, it's starting with both little things and the big things, and, and those are the things that add up to something. Anybody yeah. else have any comments or questions? If, or? I can, if I can just sort of add to that a little bit, you know, I've um, I, I mentioned the small things and the importance of them, and 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 Lee, I, I don't dis disagree with you or Roger on the importance of of you know the the big thing, the big shiny object that would be great to have here in San Diego, but I think that the important thing is that um, there's something happening here that. Uh, that is not that unfortunately, right? We just don't have that. And you know, I've been involved in some really big ideas and visions for San Diego. And what I'm learning is that, uh, you know, through Mike Stepner and, and, you know, other people that I've worked with here in San Diego, that these sorts of things are so difficult here. I mean, they're just, I mean, you can push and push and it just, it's so difficult. So all I'm saying is not, not to discount that, but that because we don't necessarily have it doesn't mean we're not a great a great city. There's there, there's something happening here that is making us great. That that we, we need to you know we need to sort of um, shine a light on right. Mm -hmm. We need to make it make the rest of the world um, see what's happening. And I think that's that's what it is. So I think that's something that we we should maybe focus focus on at least for this world design capital element and and hopefully that leads to that that big shiny you know object as well some star architecture if if <laughs> that's what needs to happen um maybe that's the end end goal by raising the um the the discussion and the dialogue and and, and drawing the attention of the rest of the world through this this whole uh, world design capital um you know yeah. it's it's not the the big thing or the little thing it, it's raising the quality of life for the people in the region yeah and yeah. it's, it's a lot of things, and it's a continuum. We will work on this continuously. I look at all the people on the screen. I've been around a long time, and I, you know, I've seen things come and go. And we make two steps forward and one step backward. But here's another opportunity that really brings people together that we can make, I think, some meaningful changes and add to the quality of, of what we have here in, in the region. And uh, I came here by ship many, many years ago, hated the place, and... Uh, but I stayed and I think it's, it's a place I would not want to move from. I wouldn't want to go back in that ship either. I don't think it's around anymore, but that was the Navy days. 
I, I do want to add one thing. I, I noted it in the chat, and I see a lot of uh, acronyms around around this virtual room here. You know, for those of us who are like AI San Diego, part of a national organization, you know, AI San Diego is a chapter. We're not big, but AIA National is, and this is a big deal. I mean, this is we're the first binational region. We're the first, um, you know, U.S. city to be recognized with this distinction. So. I implore all of you who are part of bigger entities, call upon them and lean on them and ask for their resources so that you can make your efforts go much, much further. I mean, I know we will be doing that. I spoke with May Lynn about doing that. I hope ASLA will do that. I hope APA will do that. Um, and I'm sure there are others. Chuck Kaminsky. Thanks, Mike. Uh, great conversation. I really enjoyed listening to about this. I just posted a, a map in the chat uh, of the trans border area as it relates to the native peoples. And I think um, approaching the native peoples because they were the ones that crossed the border way before this, this uh, Tijuana San Diego did and somehow engaging with them to participate in, in the event in 2024 will bring uh, a richness that perhaps um, we have not thought about. So I, I threw that out there. Um, and um, I, I did two other comments uh, that were answered in the chat. And the second comment was, uh, I was really taken by the, uh, the uh, initial presentation, I think it was by Michelle who mentioned bringing design uh, to mothers, grandmothers. I don't know if those were her words, uh, but I found that to be really, really, really important. And um, my concern is that it, it doesn't come across as elitism or privileged um, notions that somehow that ground up as it's described on the, the site, on the website, really, really bring those elements together so that their innovation and their ideas uh, ring true for them. Uh, so that it's not uh, this top-down um, architects and designers uh, typical approach, but really embraces uh, the uniqueness and the uh, unexplored uh, creativity that people who are not involved in design can bring to the table. So those were the two comments, but I really found the, the trans-border uh, Native Peoples Map really interesting for me. Thank you. And good luck. This is a great project. I, I would, and and I agree with Lee that, and as Mike said, we've he's talked about this uh, things like this for 15 years, 20 years, and we go home. What was that after a, a nice cocktail dinner and nothing happens? And so that's maybe that's an aspect to think about <sighs> as you put your formulation together. What happens next? You know, and not save it for the last day, but start thinking about it now. So thank you. And Roger has suggested that we collect all the old reports in 2023 from the last 50 years. And I think that would be a great idea if someone would come over to my garage and clean it out because <laughs> most of them are there. Uh, <laughs> my wife would just really thank you all for that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap this up and ask if, if any of the panelists have any last comments, Michelle and May Lynn and Carlos and David and, and Margaret, and then uh, I'll turn it back to Josh. I just wanted to say a couple of things, um, some that, that segue nicely and some that don't. Um, you know, I think that uh, that what's uh, what's interesting about, you know, our bid and what was not, not surprising to us, but, you know, there's been a lot of attention from uh, the previously designated cities about our bid. So it, on the one hand, we what, what we find maybe to be really challenging and difficult from the outside, you know, one of the words from, from one of the CEOs was, we've never seen a more advanced bid in terms of design. We want to be a part of what you're doing. How can we help you? Because similarly, I think some of the, the, the previous cities feel like, okay, we did this thing. We wanted it to be more than a, you know, we wanted it to be more than just a, you know, a ceremonial or, you know, a, a, a publicity stunt, stunt on steroids. And some of that ROI is not going to come for 10 years, right? Um, but how do we basically like use the really use this cohort as a, as a way to catapult well into the future and bring in all these things from the past? So I would just say, you know, we've heard from several people this, they, that they were just impressed or really, you know, gave them pause to say, wow, there's a, a lot of depth and intricacies of design happening in San Diego, Tijuana that we, we haven't seen before. Uh, that's one thing. Another thing, I think because we have so many wonderful universities and, um, and educational institutions, whether they be, you know, on the academic side or co-curricular, um, 
we, we've been able to do things like code the bid. You know, we actually have an inventory now, a searchable inventory that is not in a PDF, you know, um, but, uh, you know, but that, that people can start to utilize in a way that we haven't had before. Now, who's to say what we can do with those things, but I think there's an opportunity to leverage some of the amazing talent that we have here to pull in what you were talking about, Mike. <laughs> Let, let's take those old reports. Let's talk, like we wanna document the journey because we believe that the past, um, you know, um, needs to be tweaked in terms of how we proceed forward with these bids. It can't just be one city, one government letter of credit. Like that's not how most of the world works, right? And that certainly isn't inclusive. Uh, so that's another another piece that I think is super exciting. And the last piece I'll say is, uh, you know, partnering with. And you know, we have lots of coalitions and alliances in our region, which is awesome. And so partnering with people like the Data Science Alliance and hearing them say, like, <laughs> they went and looked at the impact reports. So they're like, okay, we think we can do better. And then after having conversations with designers and they're like, we have a whole other idea of how we can start to do data science and analytics around what this is. And so I think that's really exciting because that's also one of our, you know, superpowers in our region, helping lead the, you know, the charge on, on, on uh, data and, and uh, data science and performance analytics. So I think there's a lot of opportunity here that will bring in the past and, and really help us model internally and, and, and globally, um, you know, how things might move forward in the future or, you know, and can be iterated upon in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Carlos, Maylin. Oh, I was just going to offer, you know, I know that we're up against it with uh, our city and planning and codes and all, but if not now, when could we push for change, right? So that, I mean, I, I feel like since the spotlight is on them, honestly, the mayor, uh, <laughs> mayors of both cities, like, I think that this is an opportunity for the design community and others to push push for change. Absolutely right. This is a this is an opportunity. I mean, it, it's just a lot of things are coming together, and the designation gives us that framework to, to make some of these changes. Whether it's the way the city hires and restructures its planning functions, how it meets some of the initiatives that they've talked about, or other things in terms of infrastructure and, and as I mentioned, the communities of concern and climate equity, all these things, this provides, a, to me, it's a framework for really thinking about all these things and maybe making some changes. Uh, Carlos? Yeah, sure. And, you know, piggybacking on that, uh, on that comment, this, this is the perfect time to, to push for that transformative change. The coalition is large enough to magnify the message to elected officials that, you know, I often use not always successfully, but I think in this in this case, it is very successful. Um, when we tell them that they are our elected officials and they come and go, we stay. So we get to decide. And uh, the more we push that narrative, uh, you know, the, the, the more inclined they are to listen to us because uh, then that push becomes permanent. It's not just, you know, in a budget cycle, or you know, uh, in a year, they know that this is going to be a continuous narrative that we will keep pushing, um, you know, even beyond 2024. Wow. And uh, and that is that is a force to reckon with. It's it's a it's a community impact uh, that you know transforms the way in which I think traditionally lobbying or advocating has been done in uh, in the region, not only for uh, for San Diego. And uh, ju I just wanted to share. A very small, you know, window uh, into our um, uh, the site visit experience that I think speaks to part of the authenticity, uh, and it kind of sparked of a glitch that we had in one of the events. Uh, it was in Tijuana. It was a community event with the uh, designer community, um, and uh, pretty much thirty minutes into the this fantastic celebration of the um, of the Tijuana uh, design community uh, in a in a reclaimed space that used to be a theater 80 years ago that is open air um, you know of course of any day it started raining like we had a beautiful you know like thunderstorm that you know uh, lit up the sky uh, it electrified you know the ambience it was beautiful but we got soaked and we asked our our our, um, our guest Bertrand if he wanted to leave, and he said, 
I can't leave because no, A, nobody's leaving, like everyone is staying. And two, I'm really enjoying the conversation with the young designers and, you know, uh, with, you know, other civic leaders. I think there were, there was a group from Tijuana Innovadora that I called the elders. Don't tell them that I called them the elders. Uh, that I was also there. I'm like, I can't leave. This is incredible. So what could have potentially derailed, you know, uh, an event ended up, uh, you know, having this experience that was very intimate. And of course, he really liked the craft cocktails. So that helped a little bit. Um, but, but that is the authenticity that, you know, we cannot fake here in our region. And that came across in every single stop, both in Tijuana and in San Diego. Uh, the community spoke for itself. And, uh, and that is something that, that is of great value. That is, you know, beyond the pretty and the greedy. That's it's just very authentic. Thank you, Margit or David. Anything? Um, what I'm kind of hearing um, is that we're going to you know, put more stuff on our plate. But what I'm kind of hearing is that at the end of 2024, that we have almost a forum of some sort that may say, okay, this is what we did. This is what we learned. And what are we going to do next? <clears throat> Sorry. And then in 25 and 26 and 27, have some kind of accountability summit on are we making and reaching these goals? And are we holding our you know, people speak to the fire and keeping the conversation alive and making sure that we have a report card? I think that the, the we're creating a future if we you know, just eat the sheet cake and, and leave the party, we haven't done any service to ourselves. David, thank you. David? Yeah, uh, the last thing I'd just like to add is that, you know, I think some of the greatest things that have, that have been produced have been as a result of uh, clashing cultures or two cultures have collided. And, um, and I think that we have an opportunity here to to sort of embrace the, the collision of the two cultures uh, in, in a greater way. So I'm really excited about that. I think that um, that uh, the other thing that's gonna be important is, you know, it's not just the, the cultures coming together, it's also the various design industries. And I found, you know, uh, that I think that's also when great new ideas um, occur. And I think hopefully it'll, it'll lead to uh, maybe some new thought and some new consideration and, and the way that we, we approach the built environment just from the inspiration. I think, you know, we're, we're bound to get from, you know, the graphic designers or the um, uh, just photographers, whoever, I mean, in, uh, that are doing maybe different things, but they're still designing things. So there's a, there's a great opportunity here um, the San Diego Architectural Foundation is, is taking this very seriously. We've asked Margit to lead uh, a, a committee that will help us to, you know, be a, a good partner in this, along with um, the other organizations. We're excited about it, and we're going to gear up, and we're going to take this seriously because, as Mike put earlier, uh, you know, we we need to as as a community. We need to start taking this this seriously. We need to. Um, we, uh, it's, it's been too long that we've been recognized only as, as I mentioned earlier, you know, great beaches and a, and a great climate. It's, it's time that, uh, that the world recognize the other <laughs> great things that are happening here in San Diego from a design standpoint. So thank you everybody in, uh, you know, for being a part of this and having an interest. Thank you, Michelle, for, you know, making this happen along with the others. Um, that have really sort of, uh, you know, um, been sort of the instigators of what's happening. And um, like I said, we're excited to be a part of it. Thank you, David. I wanna thank the panel for giving us our marching orders and what we're gonna be doing for the next few years and beyond. And so with that, thank you very much. I'll do this even though we're not in the same room. And I'll turn it back to Josh for closing remarks and Announcements. Press Alt A, whatever you have to do, Chad. You're muted. There we go. Now I'm not muted. Uh, thank you, everybody. This is such a fantastic panel, um, as you can tell, with all the questions we had. Such a great conversation that um, we'll be able to keep having for the next few years. Um, 
want to announce for the next month, we have Jeff Graham from UCSD uh, coming to speak. We are going to do this one on the fourth Saturday again next month because of the holiday weekend. So it'll be on the 26th at 930. We will be sending a mailing for it, of course. Um, but Jeff Graham will be speaking about UCSD's development plans, current and the future. So it'll be a very good lecture for the, for the area. And as we close out today, I want to play the video that was submitted as the post site visit summary for, for this presentation that we just saw. So um, thank you everybody for joining and I'm gonna share my screen and let you guys watch this. It's about three and a half minutes. So um, as soon as we're done with that, then we'll close out the session. So thank you very much.